This is environmental stress. This isn't the Fusarium wilt. So one of the big things is that it'll curl up to protect itself. And that's just a sign to say, hey, something's going on in the environment and I need help. Go figure it out. So here's a good thing that I'm gonna talk about with uh, Fusarium wilt and what we're gonna do to amend it. So it produces a great plant, it produces fruit, and then it just withers and dies. That's normally uh, Fusarium wilt. It can be a pretty common problem in vegetables and vegetable crops. You try to get the seeds that are resistant and you still get it. And mainly that's due to your weather patterns that you get. So the easiest way to treat that is through nutrition. It's actually a nutrition issue. So what we're gonna do is we're going to add a double phosphate. We're gonna add some microorganisms and we're gonna add some liquid hummus. And I'll put that into the video below. And that will give the plants a little bit of boosting because just like human beings or any other living animal, if you have chickens or cows or anything like that, you need to boost the nutrition because every living thing needs to have a proper balanced diet and your plants are really under the rain. Hence why we have our nice covering and they're not wilty. Um, that's one of the big uh, technologies of why you can just use a covered thing versus a full greenhouse. I only saw a couple that have uh, Fusarium wilt in this one. It's pretty common. This one over here, this is stunted growth. That one's stunted growth. And this is actually mite. See how it looks really crispy on top and they curl really high up? That's normally a sign of mite. But we've been really treating for mites because we know that's one of our big issues. Uh, on the farm, we really suffer from mite, nematode, and uh, apparently this year we're suffering from blossom and rot in our greenhouse, but not too bad considering the weight that we're producing. All right, the other question I got asked in the comments this week, uh, how big are your greenhouses? Our greenhouses are 10 meters by uh, 45 meters, so about 450 square meters. That's just plantable space. That doesn't include best foot bath, gravel, sort room, and that, that added an extra like uh, 10 square meters per room. We decided that we planted the, these houses a couple times now. We decided that Five one meter wide beds with nice workable pathways seems to be the best. The plants get a lot of space. They seem to enjoy it. And it's much easier for us to work and trellis because that's one of the other big things. If you saw in some of our other ones, especially all oh, but up to it, we had them planted pretty much to the edge where you had no space. So you were kind of like stuck going right down the side. And we were able to maximize our... Uh, planting part, but it really didn't change any of the yield. So 450 square meters, it gets you about 960 plants spaced at 18 inches or 45 centimeters in a triangle pattern. We try to do everything in a triangle. Again, you're not always gonna grow the most perfect plants. Some are gonna die on you no matter what you do. That's just the way it is. So you have to plant more than enough to cover the operating cost of your greenhouse. Hopefully that answers your question on our size of our greenhouse and why we plant in this direction. So I got asked one of the questions in the comments, uh, when do you start uh, pruning up your tomatoes? That's a great question. I'll show with a good example. So we have this plant that is about four feet tall. You want to start pruning your leaves when they touch the ground, okay? Now, if you had plastic mulch, you could, you could um, not prune them up because you have a barrier, but because we don't really like plastic mulch and plastic mulch is expensive and it's plastic and you will throw it away every time you plant. So let's say it costs uh, like $200 uh, a greenhouse. I don't know how much it costs. Like it's like 450 meters a roll. So it's like 60 bucks a roll. And then if you uh, use it and you can't reuse it and you have to re-amend your soil, till it up, get all the root mass out, you just throw the rest of that away. Now there is 
cornstarch, plastic mulch that will biodegrade into the soil as you till it in throughout the season. It will just uh, pretty much like evaporate over the year and you can till it back in. That one's good, but we just don't have access to that. We'd have the regular plastic mulch. So when the question is, you want to start deleafing when your leaves start touching the soil because that's gonna be your biggest threat to soil borne illnesses is when the water splashes. That's why we use drip and that's why we prune them up. So here I would start having the guys prune them up. We're just tackling irrigation because our other plants have already fruited. So we're gonna do that. This is greenhouse two. Trina's picking up some fallen uh, tomato plants. So she's crazy about tomatoes. This one's doing a much better than uh, greenhouse one in the sense of nutrient retainment. Um, we know that this is a bigger one meter wide path. It still has the normal process. We have a little bit of uh, fusarium wilt. Again, I'm busy treating that. A lot of that I can prevent with some uh, different processes. Like I said, I'm gonna list that all down in the video as I edit it. But we noticed that this really produced really well. These seeds are resistant. These are the east-west uh, Diamante or D-Max uh, <laughs> in the Facebook groups. And it works pretty good. So we figured that we could do one meter bed, 75 centimeter rows, one meter row wide space, and then just simple uh, tie wire and GI wire to trellis twine and tomato clips. Works pretty good. These are our babies that we had that were like super tiny. Remember, I was like so worried about this. This shows the hardiness of the plant. Tomatoes are such a vigorous feeder that we're going to make some adjustments to our soil so that we slow down because right now we're feeding almost twice a week for the tomato plants which is 10 grams per plant that adds up a lot 740 plants inside here 740 to 900 plants inside this greenhouse alone that adds up to a hefty bill uh, when it comes to fertilization but overall it's been really good uh, to see the growth We've already started to get some flowering, but they're still very much in a vegetative state. So these guys might even be bigger than the avatar because we're seeing a little bit of fruit here or there, a little bit of inconsistency, but we're starting to just see just very little bit of flowers. So I'll have to keep an eye on that to make sure that these do flower. The one competitive advantage that outside with no netting versus inside has Oh, we got, we got one down train, one's, one's down, done. It's collapsed on itself. Oh no. We'll have to pick it up. So this is the normal thing. We just go pick that guy up and uh, re-trellis him up. Normally they bounce back pretty good. This is your mite signs. So that's what mites look like. It just comes in and stunts us. That's mites on a tomato plant. A little bit of guys slacking here. This could be due to the line, could be whatever. We're starting to see a little bit of flowering right there. But uh, one thing I do worry about with the inside versus the outside, it has access to bees and this does not. So I've not grown this inside a shade house to see whether you have to hand pollinate it where you just come and you just shake it like that. So if you just shake it, electric toothbrush, you could use an electric toothbrush and you just shake the leaves. Otherwise you just go down the row and you just shake the plants. <laughs> Right? So you just shake the plants, as Trina will demonstrate there. Save him, he's tilted. But other than that, these guys look really good. I mean, they're super green. They're not too much green that it's like, oh, I'm on too much nitrogen. Uh, testing the soil. We already know what we put into the soil, what we're putting on our plants, which is really key. And now we're uh, just kind of waiting and hoping that we'll start getting a lot of flowering here. Again, I, they're a little bit behind in terms of like, Size wise, these guys got a little bit stunted. You have some that did pollinate successfully, but they're they're very much two weeks, three weeks behind mini greenhouse. So yeah, I mean, I think everything's going good. I figured this one would probably be ready for harvest in another month, maybe longer. Again, you don't want to rush your plants. You want to make sure you're delivering a good product to the marketplace. And these guys are one of our best sellers when it comes to tomatoes. People are really impressed. They, they said they really like them. This is the one brand that we grew really well outside in our test uh, greenhouse and it worked really well. People really said, we want that tomato. We don't want the market tomato, which is funny because it really is the market tomato. It's just, we grew it in a specific way that produced the best type of tomato, which is the most important thing. I'm glad that we're able to make it out here, even though it's later in the day. Thanks for stopping by. Leave a like, subscribe, comment, and share. 
and we'll catch you in the next video. Get it. Get, get that spiky fruit. I feel it's like watching the kids. Get it, pull. Don't break that branch. Don't you do it. See, it's not ready. Otherwise, it just pop right off. Good job.